So in today's video, we are going to compare every major version of the Retina MacBook Pro to date. So to start, let's break down which 15 inch MacBook Pros are worth comparing. For the purposes of this video, I'm gonna break down the last seven years of updates into five major iterations. First up, we have mid 2012, early 2013 MacBook Pros. These models all come with quad core Ivy Bridge i7s and all come equipped with NVIDIA GT 650M graphics with one gigabyte of VRAM. By default, these guys came with eight gigabytes of 1600 megahertz DDR3 RAM that could be upgraded at the time of purchase, but not after the fact, with 16 gigabytes of RAM. The next major version is late 2013 and mid 2014. These models, which are nearly identical, run newer Haswell quad core i7s and faster GT 750M graphics with two gigs of VRAM on higher tier models. And they also upgrade from Thunderbolt 1 to Thunderbolt 2. Unlike previous years, these models have integrated graphics on the base model configurations. However, the late 2013 starts with eight gigabytes of RAM while the 2014 base model has 16. Apart from the RAM on the starting configurations, the only differences between the late 2013 and mid 2014 are the processor clock speeds and the performance difference is negligible. Next up, we have the last of the original Retina MacBook Pros, the mid-2015. This model continues to use quad-core Haswell i7s like the preceding 2014 and 13 iterations, but it adds faster AMD R9 M370X graphics with two gigabytes of VRAM to the higher tier models, as well as force touch trackpads across the board. Also, like the late 2013 and mid 2014 models, the base model 2015 MacBook Pro will come with integrated graphics, reserving the dual graphics for higher tier configurations. Now we move into the touch bar generation with the 2016, 2017, 15 inch MacBook Pros. These come with Skylake or KB Lake CPUs and Radeon Pro 400 and 500 series graphics, respectively. I've decided to group these two together because the performance differences and the configurations are so close that most people won't even notice them. KB Lake and Skylake perform pretty much the same, and the 500 series Radeon Pro graphics are literally the same chips as the 400, just with different clock speeds. All 2016, 17, 15 inch models have 16 gigabytes of RAM, four Thunderbolt 3 ports, and they all have notoriously unreliable keyboards, making them the most unreliable of the current generation. Finally, we have the 2018 and 2019 MacBook Pros. These offer the most significant performance gains in the CPU space since dual core switched to quad core. Seriously, the 2012 all the way through the 2017 models are all within single digit percentages of each other of the preceding models, but the 2018 and 2019 MacBook Pros have like 30, 40, 50% performance gains. Wakey, wakey. The six core i7s and the i9 on the 2018 models all perform pretty much the same thanks to thermal limitations. And the eight core i9 on the 2019 MacBook Pro is an absolute screamer that even rivals the iMac Pro in terms of raw horsepower. All of these models have 16 gigabytes of RAM that could be upgraded to 32 gigabytes and higher tier models have the option of Vega graphics which is nice because by default, they're still using a refined Polaris architecture, essentially unchanged since 2016. So with all of these models laid out, let's compare them. And we're gonna start with the CPUs. In Cinebench R20, you can see a clear gain in performance with a fairly noticeable plateau in the middle of the graph. There are noticeable gains marked by the Switch to Haswell CPUs, and then again with the increased core count on 2019 and 2018 MacBooks but you'll notice that pretty much from 2013 to 2017, there's not a whole lot of performance gains to be had here. Moving over to Geekbench 4, we see a similar trend. The models in the middle all perform fairly similar. 2013 to 17 MacBook Pros all have CPU performance within a margin of error of each other in these tests. So if that's what's important to you, you'll get just as much out of a late 2013 as you will out of a 2017, but at half the cost. If we move over to graphics, we have a very linear increase in performance as shown by Unigen Heaven. It is important to note that all of the models I tested have dedicated graphics. The integrated graphics models all actually perform very similar to the GT 650M seen at the bottom of the chart. Another thing worth noting is that the 2016 MacBook Pro here has the upgraded Radeon Pro 460 graphics with four gigabytes of VRAM. 
the base 450 model is within spitting distance of the mid-2015's AMD graphics. When we put all of this together, the thing that stands out the most is the overall poor value of the 2016 and 2017 MacBook Pros when you're looking at retail pricing. Considering the fact that the 2015 will actually outperform the CPU of these models in a good number of situations, and the fact that if you don't have the upgraded graphics on the 2016 or 17s, the graphics performance is going to be very, very similar on these two models. Yet the 2015 is going to save several hundred dollars, have a more reliable keyboard, upgradable SSD, and a lot more ports. You can see why these machines are so popular. The problems for the 2016 17s compound when we look at prices. You can see a clear jump in the average prices for the models I tested when you get to the current generation. Unless you're lucky and snag a nice upgraded 2016 for less than a 2015 goes for, the 2015 is a clear choice because of its very, very close performance and those added benefits. Now, another thing to note is that while the 2018 and 19 models are by far the best in terms of performance, they do have a pretty sizable price premium at the moment. But given another year, they'll probably be a very solid value. So we've reached the point in the video where we need to go beyond just specs and performance. After all, no Mac is built to be the most powerful computer for the money. And in fact, some of them aren't built so well at all. Let's discuss. There is one issue that can affect every Retina MacBook out there, the famed Stangate problem. My 2012 Retina has it pretty bad. You can see the display coating peeling off all over the place. If your machine is under four years old, you can get a free display replacement to resolve the issue, but beyond cosmetics, there are some more serious problems. The 2012 and early 2013 Retinas have a known graphics issue with an IC on the board that controls voltage to the GPU. The effects are similar to that of graphics failure as you might see on a 2011 MacBook Pro, but the graphics card isn't to blame here. The issue can be resolved by resoldering the affected IC, however it's not the most cost effective repair as these machines aren't worth a whole lot of money anymore. The most obvious and widespread issue here is the butterfly keyboard on newer models. It's a major, major problem for 2016-17 MacBook Pros, but fortunately they are all covered for replacements should any issues arrive. The replacements also entail a new battery, which is a plus if you have a three-year-old machine. Additionally, as I demonstrated back in July, there is always a chance that if you have a recurring issue with the keyboard, you can get a new model as a replacement. That's how I ended up with my 2019 Core i9 MacBook Pro. I used to have a 2016 MacBook Pro, but after three keyboard failures, they ended up replacing my device with a brand new one for free. Speaking of a brand new one, the 2018 and 19 models have much more reliable keyboards, but they're still covered for four years just like the others if any issues should arise. Okay, so let's talk about my overall recommendations and we'll start down here with the 2012-2013 models. These guys actually offer pretty decent performance considering that they're six or seven years old and they have pretty good display quality. However, they're not the best value. In a lot of cases, they're more expensive than a unibody MacBook Pro from 2012. However, the 2012 unibody is gonna offer the same performance but with added upgradability. So I would say if you can find one of these that's really, really cheap, and you're willing to put up with potential issues, then they're not bad, but I wouldn't recommend them. The late 2013, mid 2014, 15 inch Retina MacBook Pros, especially the ones with dual graphics, are a great value sweet spot. You can find them for about six to $800, depending on the condition and the specs, and they offer a great value sweet spot considering that you can get very decent performance in video editing and graphic design. The mid-2015, especially the model with dual graphics, is a great value. They can beat out a 2016-17 in quite a few areas and come in at a significantly lower cost. Add to that the fact that they've got great ports and upgradable solid state drives just like the rest of the original MacBook Pros and this is a fantastic value. And they're also gonna be supported for many years to come. So before we move on to the new generation, I wanna just quickly mention the integrated graphics versions of the 2013 to 2015 MacBook Pros. I don't really focus on them too, too much because the dedicated graphics models are not a whole lot more expensive and give you a lot better performance. And as far as the integrated graphics models, they're all pretty much the same once you go from 2013, 14, 15. So you might as well just go with a 2013 or a 2014 because they're not really gonna perform any worse than a 2015, but they might be less expensive. The 2016, 17 ones are tricky because they've got decent performance, great design, they're thin, they're light, they have great battery life, but 
they do have some problems and they're not terribly great value when compared to a 2015. So I would say if you can find one of these that's really cheap, somewhere around the $1,000 mark where this guy belongs or $850 like I paid for this one, then I would say it's worth considering. But at $1,300, $1,400, $1,500, these things are too expensive right now. Then we get to the 2018, 2019 models. These things are pretty powerful. The six core, eight core CPUs, once you get up to like Vega graphics, these are very solid workstations and you can rely on these for a lot of heavy applications. They've also got much, much more reliable keyboards. I can personally attest to the fact that the 2019 keyboard is so much better than the older 2016, 17 models. And yeah, sure, they are a little bit expensive right now, but given another year or so, they're gonna be in a really good spot and they offer really fantastic performance. So there you have it. That is every major version of the Retina MacBook Pro, all the way back from 2012 to 2019. I personally love 15 inch MacBook Pros, but they can have some issues. So it's worth taking your time and doing some research. Now, obviously I can't answer every single question that you might have. This video is designed to help you make a decision if you're shopping for one of these machines, but Obviously, I can't give you all of the answers because I don't know your individual working situation. What I will recommend is that once you settle on a model that you wanna shop for, when you go on eBay, look for that model specifically. So for example, rather than searching for a Retina MacBook Pro and then trying to find one from mid 2015, I would search mid 2015, 15 inch Retina MacBook Pro dedicated graphics. The more specific you get, the more you tend to weed out overpriced listings. So with that, I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know down in the comments below which of these is your favorite generation or version of the Retina MacBook Pro. And as usual, don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Luke Miani. Please consider joining my subreddit, which is linked down in the description below. And with that, I'll see you all in the next video.